So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Technology Integration Workshop powered by Best Prep. And uh, my name is Kathy Funston. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Pathways with Burnsville Egan Savage School District. And I'm gonna be your host for this session. Uh, we are really thrilled today to have Jen McCarty Plucker and Ashley Gamlin from Mackin Educational Resources as your presenters. And their session is titled Supporting Students Through Inquiry-Driven Learning. Now, there are a few uh, housekeeping things that we want to talk about very quickly here. So um, please make sure that when you are asking a question, go to the chat box. Um, Ashley, Jen, and I will all be monitoring that. So we want to make sure that we answer your questions. And um, this will also be recorded. So you will be able to hear those answers as you listen to the recording later in the day. Uh, you can also access the session later today in the recorded sessions widget of the Spot Me website. And you'll have a whole year to view that. Um, so you can play it, rewind it, share it with your friends. You'll have full access to it. You can also watch all of the other sessions that you've attended or other sessions um, during the workshops that you would like to view. Additionally, Best Prep is collecting feedback on all of the sessions, so please complete the survey, and the link is on the breakout page on the agenda of the Spot Me website. If you haven't already muted yourself, um, please do so, and you'll find your mute button in the far left side, um, just to avoid any kind of background noise as uh, Jen and Ashley are presenting today. And if there are no other pieces that we need to cover here, and I don't think so, let's get going. So I am absolutely thrilled to introduce Jen McCarty Plucker and Ashley Gamlin from Mac and Resources. And they're going to share their wealth of knowledge um, on supporting students through inquiry-driven learning. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you. Kathy. It's great to be here. We're excited uh, to share some ideas with you. Uh, we both are former classroom teachers, and so um, we're just excited to be with educators this morning. You'll notice that there is a bit.ly link on this front page. I will put that in the chat in just a moment. When Ashley takes over, I'll put that in the, the chat for you. But that's going to take you to a Google folder. And in that folder will be the slideshow as well as some additional resources. Uh, our, I am the director of Pro professional learning and our department puts together one page research into practice articles. And so we put, picked a few that we thought might be interesting for you and threw those in the folder. And then we are going to be talking about Mac and Via as a platform or a tool for you. It is a free platform and um, we're going to be demoing it and showing it to you. Some of you may be familiar with it, uh, but we did go through the participants of Best Prep uh, our e-services team did um, and did our best to see if you already have Mac and Via accounts because you might not know if you have one. So there is an incomplete, um, probably not totally accurate document in the folder that has a list of the schools that are participating in Best Prep and we highlighted those that we know for sure have Mac and Via. Um, there are some that we're not completely sure but we certainly can find out for you uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, you can reach out to us and, and we'd be happy to figure that out if you're interested. If you'll go to the next slide, Ashley. Just a, a reminder too to um, mark yourself as here in uh, the um, event site so that you get marked for attendance. And we would invite you too to use the chat feature to go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and um, what your role is and um, maybe where you're listening from and then also where you work when you are able to be brick and mortar. So again, my name is Jen McCarty Plucker. I was formerly in the Rosemont Apple Valley Egan School District and actually Kathy and I go way back. Um, Kathy was the director of curriculum when I was doing some uh, committee work with under her leadership for secondary literacy and language arts. Um, so I'm just, it's a joy to see Kathy's face this morning. Our, and she's a, been a fabulous moderator and will continue to be um, during this session. 
I was an English teacher, a reading teacher, a speech coach. I've been a district administrator. I have worn lots of hats uh, in the Rosemont Apple Valley Egan School District. But just three years ago, I chose to come to Mackin. Uh, Mackin is an education solutions organization. We provide print, digital, makerspace solutions to districts all across the globe. And there was a desire to start a professional learning division. And I had had such great experiences working with Mackin as a district leader and as a language arts curriculum leader that uh, I was really excited to come try this. And uh, it's been a journey and a really exciting um, chapter in my career. Ashley. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Ashley Gamlin and I have a bachelor's in elementary education and I received my master's in reading instruction. Um, I was primarily an elementary school teacher, taught first and second grade mostly. Um, I have experience in special education and I did a lot of summer school um, throughout the years as well. So I've taught from K to um, fifth grade during those experiences. Um, and now I am a classroom specialist at Mackin. I've been here for about three years. Um, and I'm just excited to share what I've learned. I've worked across um, a few different districts. So I've taught different styles. Um, and so I will be bringing that experience to you today during our presentation. Again, the bit.ly is at the bottom of the screen and Jen's gonna um, put that into the chat for you. So today we're gonna talk about um, why inquiry-driven learning and why we think it's important. Um, how can you curate your resources to support student inquiry? We're gonna dive into Mac and Via if you don't already have it. Um, we're going to really show you what the groups lo looks like, that feature that's really helped to support inquiry learning. And then we are going to dive into the um, extra tools that can help support student achievement and engagement. Before we dive into inquiry and talk about it, we thought it was important that we play a video by John Spencer. You may know him. Um, he's very popular and he has these really great ideas based around inquiry. So we're going to watch a short video um, about what is inquiry. In the Order of the Phoenix, the fifth of the Harry Potter series, Dolores Umbridge takes over as the defense. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. In the Order of the Phoenix, the fifth of the Harry Potter series, Dolores Umbridge takes over as the defense against the dark arts teacher and instantly transforms the classroom into this textbook-based, standardized, test-focused classroom. And Harry questions whether this will prepare them for fighting against Voldemort, uh, uh, he who must not be named. And that's when Umbridge punishes him. And he ends up forming his own school within a school called Dumbledore's Army. Now, Dumbledore's Army is purely inquiry-based. While Harry is the teacher, he is mostly the guide on the side, empowering students to ask questions and find the answers themselves. They rely on each other and on various spell books to solve problems and answer their questions. It is a space of experimentation. And while the process might seem messy compared to Umbridge's standardized approach, the students learn at a rapid pace because they aren't wasting their time repeating what they already know. This is an example of inquiry-based learning, although since it takes place in the UK, it's probably inquiry-based learning. I don't really know. Inquiry-based learning has existed for thousands of years. Both Socrates and Confucius used variations on their own inquiry-based format. It's a critical component to the scientific method of the early enlightenment, and it was a core idea of both Dewey and Montessori's ideas around student-centered learning. Padaste shares a model of the four phases of inquiry. It starts with orientation, which is often 
uh, a form of discussion. It's where they become aware of the key idea. And from there, it moves into conceptualization where students generate questions and they define a hypothesis. This leads to an investigation phase where students explore, experiment, and interpret data, often in a way that's flexible and dynamic. It can even seem kind of cyclical. And then finally, they move into a conclusion. Heather Banshee and Randy Bell defined four different types of inquiry that you can view on sort of a spectrum from teacher-centered slash structured into learner-centered slash open. Level one is confirmation inquiry where the teacher teaches the concepts, creates the questions, and models the process for students. They basically just kind of go along with it to learn about the process. Level two is structured inquiry where the teacher creates the initial set of questions and kind of shares the perspective procedures, but then the students walk through the rest of the inquiry process by collecting and analyzing the data and drawing their own conclusions. Level three is guided inquiry, and this is sort of the beginning of what we typically think of as inquiry. This is where the teacher provides the initial research question or questions, but students own the research process and the experimentation. And then level four is open inquiry or true inquiry. Here's where students formulate their own questions, design their experiments or, or their research, and collect their own data or facts that they then share in their findings. Now, here are a few places where you as a teacher can start with inquiry-based learning. In a language arts or social studies class, you can do a wonder day or one wonder week project where students develop their own questions and move through the inquiry process on their own. You can also do a genius hour project where students not only ask their own questions, but design their own product as well. In math, you could have students explore a concept and develop their own problems, which is one of the things I love about the uh, what can you do with this process of Dan Meyer. And in science, you could do something like a science fair project or a Mythbuster style approach to testing an urban legend. The key idea though is this, if we want students to own their learning, if we want them to remain curious, if we want classrooms to be bastions of curiosity and wonder, well then we need to have something like inquiry-based learning in place so that they learn how to ask great questions, find the answers, and share their results with their peers. So that's just a little bit about what is inquiry. I think John Spencer does an amazing job of explaining that, so I thought I'd let him do that for you. Um, Next, we're going to move on to the why. Why is this important? And John Spencer touches on a lot of this. Um, it follows the student learning. It, you can scaffold the learning. It really naturally differentiates. Um, there's high engagement and ownership of learning through this style as well. So I noticed this a lot when I taught an inquiry-based um, curriculum in one of the most recent districts that I taught in. And Really, I, with first grade students, I taught an inquiry unit on penguins, and we did this through a RAN chart. And instead of asking yes or no questions to students and kind of making some students feel defeated because maybe they didn't know the right answers, anything was fair game. We just threw what are our questions about penguins, and then we tracked along the way, and we found the answers through the text that we were reading and through our research together. Um, it was just like a really great way to identify what students are asking really deep questions, what students are kind of asking those surface level, and then those students who are still trying to grasp it. But all of us talking together, it just helped each other go farther. Another way, um, when I worked with fifth graders, I got to take this explored a little bit further. I had a research station and in that research station, I had the materials that I was going to be using for the next day's um, mini lesson. And I asked those students to look through that not those nonfiction texts and find really good information and flag them for the class so we can go through them together. So I really was following their learning. Um, and I, I like to tell students with nonfiction texts, you don't necessarily have to read the whole book. Um, that's, we find the information that we need and some of it's extra. And so it was really fun to watch those fifth graders get so excited that I was going to their sticky notes and saying, okay, why did you 
flag this? What's important about this and what we're learning about? So it was just a really fun, natural way to follow their learning in my experience. A way to um, kind of help with inquiry based learning. Um, John Spencer talks about like those big open ended um, inquiry. Um, we're not all ready for that. <laughs> so using units of study and incorporating inquiry with that is a great way to um, start with learning how to teach inquiry. So it's usually driven on a certain topic. Like I said, I did that on penguins, um, any topic that you're studying. And then a huge thing, it's gonna be paired with various types of literature. You're not just using one type of um, literature, you're using many different things to find your answers. You have a little bit more freedom compared to the basal text, but I am gonna to touch on how, even when I did teach through a basal style learning, I always supplemented, which was part of my inquiry. And you have more opportunity to follow that student learning because um, Debbie Miller states that real life isn't scripted and neither is real teaching. So inquiry really helps you kind of open that up to not following a script and following your students. So when I taught, um, I originally started at schools with basal um, script uh, type style teaching. I noticed that I supplemented a lot and really because my undergraduate studies didn't teach us how to follow a script. They taught us how to teach through inquiry. Um, and so I always supplemented and didn't realize that's what I was doing. It wasn't until I moved um, and started working in a district in Minnesota, 196 Egan Apple Valley Rosemount that I learned that, oh, this is inquiry learning that I was doing just supporting uh, basal text. So Daniels and Zimmelman, they, um, during my research, I found they say that textbooks continue to be overused and should be supplemented generously or replaced with other reading materials where possible. So this was the big piece about inquiry and finding a lot of materials to support what you're studying. In 196, when I taught an inquiry-based curriculum, we followed um, Fontes and Pinnell's genre study. There's lots of different models out there that work for everyone. Um, this is just what I have experience with. And in that, the first um, step is to collect your materials, and that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. Then you immerse students with those materials you study, define, and then you teach and kind of read and revise and come together and share like what you all learn together. So as we talk about being a collector of content, there are many different types of text for inquiry. Um, books, digital and print are great um, types of text to use, but you can also use articles Infographics and pictures are really great for like a quick mini lesson to get a point across or for your visual learners. I am a musician, so I always use music and videos when I was a teacher. Um, they're so much fun. Videos, I, I tend to stick to like a five minute or less video just as a quick introduction. Um, I've also recently got into podcasts. They're so widely available now and a great resource and students really enjoy listening to those as well. And so there's a lot of student centered, centered podcasts that are available and they're free, which is great. A lot of these resources you can find free. And then if your school happens to have a database um, or you want to purchase a database for your school, those are great peer reviewed resources that are a little bit better than maybe Googling all the time. So all these um, types of context or content are great for teaching inquiry. So I'm going to show you um, what it looks like in McInvia groups when we collect content and how we can house it all together. Um, this is something when I was teaching inquiry, I would find videos, I would find articles. I just kind of had like a YouTube channel that I would go to and I would have to quick load up all my links before during my prep or my lunch. Um, I 
did this penguins group with first graders. So as you can imagine, trying to load up a link last minute while they're waiting is really hard. <laughs> so um, I wish I would have had Mac and Via groups when I was a teacher because it's just a really great place to have all of your content ready to go. So in our groups feature, um, you can store digital content by unit. So anything with a URL, you can throw into this group. You can make it accessible to your students. Um, the Mac and Via platform is a free platform to use for schools. And you can share um, these groups with students and your colleagues. And I think it's great to front load the learning so they, you can have students go in there and watch some videos, read some articles ahead of time to maybe help front load learning as well. Um, you can assign reading and assignments within Mac and Via groups. And you can also integrate with Google Classroom, Canvas, Seesaw, Schoology. So it's a really great resource and it's not a whole new thing that you have to adapt and abandon everything else. You can use them in conjunction, which is really great. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a quick demonstration of a penguins group. So this is a demo of what an elementary um, Mac and Via would look like. Um, right here, we just have kind of a little owl, but it's completely customizable. Um, I recently made a Mac and Via for my mother, who's a principal. I made them for her schools. It's a very small town. And I was able to add in their school logo and their school colors and really make it custom. Um, and then, so if you're teaching secondary, um, you might choose different colors and make it more appealing to those um, students. So this is just what we have for our demo. As you can see, these are a bunch of groups that were put together. You can add a picture. Um, you can title them with whatever you would like. And then that's just a quick, easy way to access all your groups. And I'm going to go into the penguins group. It was my favorite unit. <laughs> so I've become the penguin lady. I, I love penguins so much. Um, so when I taught first grade, I uh, had a bunch of resources about penguins that I like to use. So here in the groups, when I open it up, you will see that I pulled from resources that I have within my Mac and Via. The books and audiobooks and databases are what you would purchase or what you would use that your district has. And then the videos and links are free things that I just found that I would always use no matter what to supplement. So the platform is free to use. You just purchase the digital content and then you can also add in all these links as well. So here is um, a digital or an audio book. You'll see with the little headphones here that icon lets me know that that's audio. Um, these little links show that these are articles that I found. Um, so I'll open up an article really quick. And it just kind of shows you that I just found this link and I really thought it was cute. Antarctic penguins find a research camera and take the most adorable selfies. So I just thought it was a fun way to um, share information with students about penguins. and. Uh, as you can imagine, usually the students, first grade students are laughing in the background at that. <laughs> so we also have some ebooks here. Um, you can check them out and you can open them and read them as well, depending upon their user type. This one, you only need to open it because it's a multi-user, so you don't need to check it out. These others, you have the feature to check them out. Um, Tacky the Penguin is always a fun um book to read i like to read fiction and nonfiction, especially about penguins um because then we can kind of talk as a group about why did the character in the fiction story is this what a real penguin is like um, and they talk about the characteristics that are real and fiction and it really helps drive that learning home there's a database as well and then i have a couple videos uh bbc earth penguin videos they're um pretty relevant, everybody kind of knows about the BBC Earth, but then I found this trailer, it's really quick, and I'm gonna show you what it looks like um, to listen to or to show a video within Mac and Via. So this is a, a video that I showed to introduce the Penguins units to um, my first grade students. 
Antarctica. Home to the deadly leopard seal. The mighty killer whale. And Steve. Thunder. Oh, oh. The hilarious little first graders laughing in the background. Um, it was just a really fun way. It was a quick um, trailer that I found uh, to introduce that and get my students excited about penguins. Um, after this unit, we went to the zoo and we learned about penguins, but the person who was teaching the students was very surprised they knew everything <laughs> and she didn't really have a lot of new information to share with them because they were so invested in this unit um, because I was able to use all these resources and work together. As you can see, this video is still within the Mac and Via platform. So we don't have to worry about play next and like all the stuff on the side that gets in the way. So that's a really another great feature is that you can embed it within the platform. And lastly, there are some instructions that I added at the top. I have an inquiry question. How do penguins or animals survive climate and temperature changes? So you can add any type of instructions here. Um, again, you can also integrate with Google Classroom and Schoology, um, Seesaw, and we can show that to you a little bit later. So that's a little bit about the groups. Um, the last thing I have, are just some tips for success on teaching inquiry. Um, I would say start small. Start with one lesson or one unit. Maybe share with your colleagues and you each take a unit because it's easily shared. You don't need to all input that data. Once that group is made, anyone in your school who has a Mac and Via can access that. Um, ask your librarians and colleagues to help with curating content. Ask students to help. Um, I had students always bringing in materials if they were excited about our learning and asking them to bring in stuff and share is just another great way to follow that student learning and get them involved and engaged. And the final thing is annually add that content. You wanna make sure that um, the URLs are still available and that um, I did used to show like a live video from the San Diego Zoo. And when I was creating this group, I found that that link was no longer accessible. So annually adding content, keeping it relevant and making sure that it's available is a really great way to um, incorporate inquiry into your classrooms. And with that, I'm going to have Jen uh, go a little bit deeper into the digital tools. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I want to echo what Christian said that your librarians will help you. <laughs> um, librarians are our partners and it is through that partnership that um, we really can curate these amazing resources for um, our students. So bear with me while I find the slide that I'm going to start with. So Ashley um, talked with an elementary lens. I'm going to give a little bit more of a secondary lens to this. Uh, and just to really briefly share my own story of venturing into inquiry. Uh, when I started teaching English, um, I certainly prided myself on collaboration and group work and readers theater and Socratic dialogue and all these great instructional practices. But the curriculum that I was teaching was pretty traditional. We read whole class novels. We moved on to write a paper, usually a literary analysis about that novel. And then I taught 10th grade English slash speech. So then we would give a speech or do a speech unit. Um, and I had this amazing opportunity actually under Kathy Funston's leadership where we were diving into the Common Core State Standards. We knew that Minnesota was likely to adopt those as the K-12 um, Minnesota Academic Standards for Language Arts. And Minnesota was on the feedback forum um, we were one of three states that gave feedback to the developers of the Common Core State Standards. And I had this incredible opportunity with support from the district and my building principal to be a part of that forum. Well, during that time, we as um, English teachers across Minnesota uh, developed this cohort where we went ahead and 
tried out inquiry units of study for language arts aligned to the new standards and moving away from that whole class novel approach to teaching English. And these were my results. We had much more collaboration happening in the classroom. And frankly, much more collaboration happening with teachers because we had to figure it out. And um, the way that we figured it out was we were better together. So we really leaned on each other. Um, students were self-directed learners. They, um, much more so than previously, I had a lot more students who would say, how many points is this worth? And is this graded? And um, what exactly do I have to do to finish the assignment? When we shifted to inquiry, far fewer questions. Um, and we were able to really see students fall in love with learning and move away from being passive. James asked a question in the chat about with a culturally relevant teaching lens, culturally responsive teaching lens, um, when we're thinking about our dependent learners, what do, we, what do we do if they've got independent peers? How do we manage that? And I found in the inquiry model, it was so much easier to scaffold and provide the support, keep the expectations high, the expectations never change. It's just our level of support in order for students to meet those expectations. Well, in the inquiry model, um, and I'm gonna talk briefly about the workshop framework, that allowed for that additional support to move those dependent learners to independence um, and really helping to set them up. Plus, in the inquiry model, everybody has something to bring to the table and it really honors what students already know. Where in the old model, I just assumed maybe they didn't know anything and I would just try to teach everything. Um, this really is about capitalizing on what our students bring to the table. It was student-centered. The accountability is there. That's what I was afraid of when John Spencer talks about, you know, that the continuum of inquiry. I always thought inquiry was free for all, genius hour, go forth in Montessori. And I was afraid of that because I'm a type A teacher. Um, but it isn't necessarily. It can be really guided. And when I was starting out with inquiry, I chose the essential question. I chose the material and worked with my librarian and my colleagues to curate the material so that they had a, a journey or a map. And then I just let them take some scenic routes uh, and, and drive their own learning through that. I eventually got uh, braver and um, tried to control less. And I actually found that there was more motivation, more accountability, more independence, more self-directed learning when I would let go and sit more in the back seat instead of trying to be in the driver's seat or in the teacher passenger seat driver. So the other shift that I had to make, um, and I think we want to be thinking about this in all disciplines, not just in language arts, but I really had to think about uh, shifting whole class novels and, and that shared reading. Um, Kelly Gallagher is a teacher practitioner who finds time to write lots of books, which always amazes me. I'm so um, admire teachers who have the time to put down in, in words and publish what they're doing to share with everyone. Uh, but he really helped me think about, he had to move away from whole class novels. So at first he did 50-50. Half of what students read were, everybody read the same thing, and half was choice, meaning independent reading or seminar novels, book clubs. Uh, he now, in 180 days, is more at 25% is whole class core text, 75% is um, student driven. And what I found is when I made that shift, we went from reading like six whole class novels for my 10th grade and students weren't really reading them. They were spark noting it and getting by with discussions in class and me teaching them everything that I wanted them to get out of the book the first time from the 22 times I had read it, teaching it. 
They went from six to on average, when I shifted to inquiry, students were actually reading and finishing on average 11 books in a year. Some were reading many, many more and some didn't quite make it there. Um, but it, there was much more reading going on in class, which the language art standards do not ever say a book. There's no book title uh, in there. And so there's lots of material out there that students can be reading to achieve those standards. So some tips that worked for me, really giving students choice was important. Having students set goals for completing that book. <clears throat> and it was within reason, you know, you have until this date, now you set up your calendar to read that book. I replaced quite a few whole class novels. I kind of went all in. Um, but even if it's just starting with one or two, uh, and the same is true in, in the disciplines. If we can replace some of our textbook reading with bringing in multiple perspectives so that we have some of those absent narratives, that's inquiry for students and it really allows them to interrogate that time in history. Um, same is true in science. If we can get some trade books at multiple reading levels around a, a concept, it's going to allow our students to really master those standards. Um, just a couple of examples. I'm going to kind of fly through these for the sake of time. Just watching the clock here. Um, so here's just an example. And Kathy, um, I'm going to take just a couple of extra minutes um, because I know we're we're running short. But if you could put in the chat again when I think we want. I can't remember what time we wanted to be done for questions. Throw that in the chat. So here's an example of satire. If we're studying satire, lots of great literature on satire. Here's an example from a ninth grade community unit of study. This is being done in many of the high schools in 196 right now. Uh, lots, I could talk for hours about the importance of using picture books in all of our, okay, good, 1050. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> thinking it had to be 1045. Um, lots of opportunities to use picture books to get the thinking into the room. And so we would start class with a picture book around the inquiry unit of study. In this case, how do actions and decisions of individuals affect uh, our larger community? And uh, this really allowed for that differentiation. If I had a newcomer in class and they were able to participate in the read aloud, see the images, perhaps do some writing and speaking in their first language or the language they're most comfortable in, might not be their first, um, and then have some time to try to translate that into English as they're learning English, that allows for everybody to be a part of the community. I could say more about picture books, but for the sake of time, I'm going to keep going. We also, so we've had a lot of picture books. That was part of the curating or the collecting of text. But we also had short stories and poetry that we enjoyed and wanted to keep using. The lottery has been used forever and ever, amen, and students love it. it and it's perfect for thinking about community and how traditions play into choices. Uh, Marigold's a great story that students are engaged in. So why not use those texts as shared texts that students have shown to be engaged in in the past. And then we had seminar novels. And this is where we did turn to the team at Mackin. Mackin has a classroom team of teachers who work with teachers to go through our database of 3 million titles. We work with 18,000 publishers. It's super overwhelming. Ashley is one of those lead classroom or one of those classroom specialists who works with teachers who say things like, hey, Ashley, we're doing a community unit of study in ninth grade. Here's our inquiry question. Here's some of the standards we are focused on. Can you give us some recommended titles? Oh, and by the way, here's the demographics of the students we have. Um, here are the reading levels that we would like. Can you give us some ideas? She then would give us ideas and then we as a teaching team would decide on which books are we going to offer as choices for students. And these are the choices that were um, when this unit was first developed. Likely there's been some more 
books brought in um, because great books get published every year. Um, and there are some really, really great titles that have been published uh, since this unit was first created. Here's a seventh grade example um, in American Studies. So uh, this group of teachers were developing again a, a community unit to start the year and really wanted to take an inquiry approach of thinking about we the people and what does community mean as they're studying American history. And what they chose to do was to have students read biographies of individuals that they might encounter during their study throughout the year. And uh, they purposely chose books that were um, an easier read. So uh, these are the, the we, we Who Are, Who Is series. Um, we call them the bobblehead books, but they're really written at like a third grade, fourth grade reading level and uh, gave students choice. And you'll notice in the picture on the left that some students are holding more than one book. They were asked to read one, um, and as they read it, they were asked to think about how am I like this person and how am I not like this person? And then they introduced themselves and this um, person from history to the class. And it allowed students to really see um, a whole breadth of individuals who have had an impact on American history. And I would imagine um, as uh, 196 is going through an equity audit of their curriculum that they might be bringing in um, some even, even more influential people to that unit of study. So some things to consider. We do wanna get comfortable with not knowing. We do want to gather open-ended questions. We do want students carrying the load. And the workshop framework, which is that start together, guided practice, end together routine, is what allowed me to be able to have multiple texts in the classroom. Because it's during that guided practice time that I could do small group and one-on-one -on -one teaching. So really quickly, I want to, I'm not going to be able to do a demo. We're out of time for me to go in, but we do have a demo set up for you to explore. So if you can't get into Mac and Via, Via in your own site to be able to explore, we do have a demo set up for you. And I just wanna really quickly show you how to get into that. And then I'll pull this slide back up for questions and leave it up. Um, it's also in the Google folder so that if you wanna go in and explore and just try out um, we didn't get into the tools within the e-reader, but within the e-reader, students can highlight, take notes, use the dictionary. There's a bibliography. They have text-to-speech. They can take notes and export it to Google Drive or OneDrive. So many powerful tools. Um, we'll put a video in the folder, too, so that you can kind of see how that works. Um, but just really quickly, if we go to... Um, let me just do this. So if you go to macinvia.com, and again, this will be back up on the slide, you're gonna want to, in this um, location, you're going to want to put in ZZ Classroom Demo. It should pop up for you once you start typing, but if not, this is what you'll put in. And then you can um, put in Mac in Classroom and Mac in to get in generically. Oops, sorry. Mac in Classroom is the username and Mac in is the password. And that will get you into the demo. And then if you want a backpack so that you can see what it's like to check out, take notes, all of that, um, all you need to do is to go into this login and you can either register, which is then it's you're setting up your own username and password, or if you wanna keep it generic, we have 25 generic usernames and passwords set up. User one as ID, user one password. User two, user two. So pick a number between one and 25. Um, and you probably are safe unless you end up picking up a number of someone else. So that will log you in. Whoops. And then you'll have a backpack here. So again, you can register and set up your own or um, you can 
go ahead and, and use a user. And then under groups, I did put a community inquiry unit group together that you could explore. So with that, I'll bring it back to the slide so I can leave that up and we will do some questions. Um, so go ahead and put questions in the chat. And while we're waiting for some questions, I just want to also let you know, um, I really have a ton of empathy for all of you as you're getting ready for what fall might look like. I live with a teacher. Um, I've been a teacher. I have a, a sophomore in, well, she's a junior now, yikes, in high school and a son who is going back to Nebraska as a sophomore. Um, and it's a lot of unknowns, but um, just appreciate all that you're doing. We at Mackin are doing everything we can to support our, we have a Mackin summer camp going on right now. And we just secured Catlin Tucker. She is an author of several blended learning books. She'll be doing a webinar on August 13th. Um, so we would invite you to uh, register. It's not up yet, but if you go to mackin.com slash webinar, um, which we can put in the chat for you, you can look at previous webinars that we've done. Um, we did several on distance learning essentials and um, have had uh, June and July Mac and Summer Camp uh, events. So we would love to have you be a part of it. That's all free. And um, if you're looking for some additional support. Thank you very much, Jen and Ashley. Um, you have just given us so much information. And even though we didn't have any questions in our uh, chat room, um, everyone knows how to get in touch with you in case there are questions that come up later. Thank you all very much for joining Jen and Ashley and me for this session today. And uh, please remember to complete the survey found on the survey widget. And if I'm not mistaken, many of you may be signed up for a session following this. So we wish you well. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Have a great rest of the week and have a wonderful start to the year, however that may look. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. And thank you, Kathy, for moderating. We really appreciate it.